Okay, thanks a lot. I, um, I brought a book that I just finished uh, writing. It's called The Wealth of Nature, Ecosystems, Services, Biodiversity, and Human Well-Being. And I thought I would just read this to you this, this afternoon, but, <laughs> but, but then I decided that was a bad idea. And what I'm going to do instead is give this to Kala, Whoa. and she's going to put it in the library, and you can check it out. So what I'm, I thought instead I would uh, briefly highlight some of the, of the, um, the issues that scientists are thinking about these days, and I'm sure you're thinking about them too. And if you're not, you soon will be because they're all very topical and will lead to issues um, that will be of interest to you. You're all very well aware of human infrastructure. Yeah, these are the things that we build. And we've seen from recent tragedies that these things tend to be fragile. They need a lot of um, attention. They fall apart. Uh, they, they cost a lot of money to build. They, um, they, keep, they, they use all kinds of resources. They contribute to climate change. So human infrastructure, something that we're all well familiar with, it makes our lives happier and easier. But then there's nature's infrastructure. And nature's infrastructure works in a very different way. We don't have to build this. It gets built by itself. It adapts to change. When climate change happens, the vegetation adapts, the ecosystems adapt. So nature's infrastructure is able to deliver benefits to people at basically no cost to us, except for the opportunity costs of converting them to something else. So that's um, looking at, at the human infrastructure and nature's infrastructure is a way of thinking about the values that nature provides to us. Now another word that you've all heard a lot about and that still is, um, is widely debated even among scientists on exactly what it means is biodiversity. And generally, biodiversity is thought of at, at three levels. And the first level is within species. On the left of this picture, you see a whole bunch of dogs. Well, those dogs are all the same species but they have genetic differences within them. Even though they're the same species, they have characteristics that are, that are different. And on the right, you see a, a bunch of different kinds of rice that is just really the tip of the iceberg, if you'll pardon a mixed metaphor. Um, a country like India um, historically had as many as 40,000 varieties of rice. And the genes that are contained within that 40,000 species have been modified or have been used to crossbreed and to yield the kinds of rices that you see up here, and these are the kinds that many of you still like to eat. I think that, that modern biotechnology is making new discoveries of new genes that are incredibly valuable. And I won't go into a long story on this, but just, a, just one quick anecdote. In Yellowstone National Park in the U.S. is well known for its hot springs. And one scientist was, was looking in the hot springs and trying to find microorganisms that lived in boiling water because he needed something that would help him to, um, to reproduce DNA through a, a scientific, uh, I won't go into the science of it, but it's called polymerase chain reaction. But this is what has enabled DNA to be reproduced and is now evidence in many of your courts of law. And that was by one discovery in, in a national park that is now worth at least $200 million per year. And the court cases over who gets that money whether the national park gets it, whether the, the pharmaceutical company gets it, who gets it, um, is the kind of, of issue that you're going to have facing you in the coming years. Okay, so the genetic level. Then there's the, the diversity among species. And this is what most people think of when they think of biodiversity, how many different species there are. Then in addition, 
is the diversity among ecosystems. So in this picture, you see mountain ecosystems, you see rivers, you see forests, you see agricultural land. These are different kinds of ecosystems. And all of these are enriched by biodiversity. So if you look at what biodiversity is good for, this is just a, maybe too, too, too many words for you, but biodiversity contributes to profit for, for farmers and all these, these um, a long list of things that they do. But they control pests, they, they cycle nutrients, they water cycle, they, they pollinate, they produce healthy soils and, and so forth. So biodiversity, the richness of life on the planet, is what helps to make things like agriculture productive and profitable. And if we look at how biodiversity helps the natural infrastructure of forests, and what I've put up here are just some of, of the many qualities that, that nature provides to forests, and that forests in turn provide to us. We benefit from all of these kinds of, of um, services that are provided by natural forests. So our challenge, ours being us, the community, and for ADB, is how do we balance these two different kinds of infrastructure? We need human infrastructure. We need roads, we need dams, we need houses. But we also need natural infrastructure to provide the kinds of, of response to emergencies or, or extreme natural events that we might see. How we adapt to changing conditions. And if we know anything, it's that the changes are going to continue to come faster through climate change and, and various other factors. So just um, very quickly to look at the, at the kinds of ecosystem services that we're, we've been talking about. The provisioning services, often these are, are the kinds of services that carry a price tag. You can sell these. You can figure out how much they're worth. And sometimes that means that these are given um, a higher priority than, for example, regulating services. So these are services that happen for free, but now people are starting to think, well, maybe they actually are worth something. So if we look at climate regulation, the one thing that has happened under the Framework Convention on Climate Change at their meeting in Warsaw last month was something called RED, which is, many of you will be familiar with RED. It's, that's re reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, in, especially in developing countries. Governments are willing, they've already put on the table $278 million to start to address this issue of avoiding deforestation, which is a, a, regu a regulating service because it's, it regulates um, climate and stores carbon, which is a supporting service, nutrient cycling, how, how, it, how um, biosynthesis enables us to store carbon and um, avoid climate change. And then finally, um, cultural services. And this really came out of a publication or a, a, a series of publications, a lot of work of some 1,300 scientists that came out in 2005 called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And this was the first time I saw that people were thinking of cultural services as an ecosystem service. So if you think about ecosystems and how they relate to each of you, the ecosystems within which you live, the places that you visit because it makes you happy to, to visit them, those are services that, that give you value. Maybe not value that you're willing to dig into your pocket and pay for, but sometimes, yes. Sometimes you will pay to go to a national park, for example. And, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that later. And recreation, a sense of place, even, even social value. For a, a country like China, the giant panda is worth something emotionally to the people of China. For India, the tigers are worth something. 
for, um, for the Philippines, the Philippine eagle is worth something. So these are, these are symbols of, of value to people and there's a cultural service. We also, science is, is finding that the loss of species will reduce the, the, the kinds of, of services that can be presented that restoring biodiversity will also restore ecosystem services, and that often the areas that are richest in biodiversity are also the, the ones that deliver the most ecosystem services, the most benefits to people. So this is a very good argument for why we need to conserve biodiversity. And then if we look at the, at the, the link between services and human well-being, you don't need to, to look at all the details, but just the headlines, security, the basic material for good life, health, good social relations, freedom of choice and action. Those are the kinds of fundamental um, be, uh, effects of human well-being that are provided by ecosystem services. All of those very valuable, although maybe we can't put a cash value on all of them. And on this slide, I've tried to show that, that different types of ecosystems have different components of services. And I'd like to call your attention especially to cities. So cities also have ecosystem services. They also have benefits that ecosystems provide to people. And so here, here we see um, air quality regulation, uh, water, cultural, heritage, recreation, education, and so forth. But cities also receive services from places that are, that are upstream. It's also possible to restore ecosystem services. And across the top you can see four different types of ecosystems that have been essentially destroyed and then went through a, a, a system of restoration until once again they're filled with species and are able to provide many more services than they were uh, when they were destroyed or, or greatly simplified. And then what about value? You know, how do you start to think about money and how you can value these ecosystem services? And what I've put up here is the, the multiple ways that economists have of assigning values to different kinds of ecosystem services. When it says across the, the top, total economic value, that doesn't mean that you can take each of these individual kinds of values, add them up, and then you've got the value. It doesn't work that way. Different kinds of values are, um, are trade-offs. If you, if you cut down a forest as a provisioning service to sell the, the trees, you're giving up carbon sequestration. So it's these trade-offs that we really need to think about. And when we're trying to determine the, the value of a forest, we should be looking at all of the ecosystem services, not just the value of the trees, but also the value of the forest for ecosystem, the, the carbon storage ecosystem service the amount of biodiversity that it holds, the water that it is able to retain, the landslides that it's able to prevent, and so forth. So all of this um, w was really put together by a, a working group that was led by the man in the upper right, Pavan Sukdev, who was actually a banker for um, Deutsche Bank in, in Germany. But he, he saw the light and decided that what he would do instead of being a banker is think seriously about what are the values of biodiversity and ecosystem services. So in um, 2010, this uh, series of publications came out, about a four volume set, that looked carefully at the values of different kinds of ecosystems. So coral reefs, look at the value there. 115,000 to well over $1 million per hectare per year, depending on how you um, look at, at and which services you look at. So incredibly valuable, these um, coral reefs and the destruction of coral reefs should be of great concern to us. The kinds of, of ecosystem services that come from water, 
I'll, I'll be talking about this more tomorrow, so I won't say much more today, except that they're worth, uh, in total, about $7 trillion um, per, per year. Tropical forests, worth between $6,000 and $16,000 per hectare per year, depending on the value, the, the way that the forest is being used and how it's being managed. And if we lose these forests, and we were just talking about the loss of forests from the, from the typhoon, uh, if, and I don't think we would ever lose all the forests, but it would cost $2.5 trillion per year. So here's how, uh, a way of thinking about how we, we might go about valuing something like an ecosystem. A, 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 a few stages of going through when we're thinking about values of, of ecosystems. And then if you think about the things like this, this was a, a tsunami of 2004, and in the, this, these were pictures that I took along the coast of, of um, Panga province in Thailand, where I spent two years of my youth. The areas that were protected by, by mangroves were um, saved from, from this kind of devastation. They're, they weren't totally protected by mangroves, but areas that, were, that had mangroves and coastal vegetation suffered much, le much less damage than those that had been cleared for um, uh, shrimp ponds, for example. So if we look at, at healthy ecosystems where people are part of the ecosystem, this is a, a picture I took a, where I, I was living in Nepal for a couple of years. And the, the people up there value their ecosystems. They manage them in, in ways that are sustainable, that provide benefits on a, in a sustainable way, and they manage them um, productively. And if we're able to find the right balance between the natural infrastructure, which you see here, plus the human infrastructure, which you also see, then we'll have nature smiling at us, and we can smile back at nature. Thank you.